Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. My name is Corey Heights, and I'm the founder of Prep Athletics. And joining us on today's podcast is Coach Joe Mantegna. Joe is the head coach of Blair Academy in New Jersey, and he's been there since 1999 and built it into a national prep powerhouse. He has over 300 career wins, New Jersey State Prep A titles, multiple Maple League titles, and Blair basketball alumni includes four guys who played in the NBA and over 40 Division I players. Coach Mantegna also works with USA Basketball and is the head teacher for the Luau Ding camps in U.S., Australia, and London, England. Joe, welcome to the show. Corey, thanks for uh, having me on. I really appreciate it, man. You got a yeah. great place for this stuff. You're, you're meant to be a podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> It's working out fun. And I say worst case scenario, if no one watches this, at least I get to talk to my friends and maybe learn something new. So it's, it's a win-win all around. I feel the same way. I appreciate you having me on. It should be good fun. Yeah, it should be. So tell me, where did you grow up? And uh, of all the sports, why did you pick basketball? I grew up in Western Massachusetts, right near UMass. And uh, my dad was actually a uh, legendary high school soccer and basketball coach. He's in the uh, high school basketball coaches hall of fame in Massachusetts. Um, so I grew up in gyms and, uh, you know, around sports. So that's, uh, that's kind of how it happened. It was, uh, it was predestined, I think. So it rubbed off on you, huh? <laughs> I guess so. So did you play a bunch of sports growing up or just basketball? No, I was a three sport guy growing up and, uh, basketball and soccer in, in high school. And then, uh, you know, played a little bit of college basketball at the division three level. As I tell the guys on my team, I was kind of a division four player, but, uh, playing division three, but, um, yeah, I played at Ithaca College for a few years and made a bunch of lifelong friends there. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, so Blair Academy, you guys have had ultimately a lot of success uh, during your time there. When you started, was it as nationally known as it is now? No, so we have uh, the preeminent high school wrestling program in the country the last 50 years. So there was a bunch of people that told me not to come to Blair, not to take the job here. Uh, but I really just came to be a high school basketball coach. I had been a division one and division two assistant for all of the 1990s. Um, and and I, I really just wanted to have a scenario like my father had. I didn't really have big dreams and ambitions of building what we've built. Um, but I was lucky enough to, to bring Lawal Dang and Royal Ivy to <laughs> future NBA players with me upon arrival. So uh, they made me look good until I figured it out. And how, how'd you do that? So, how did you get them to come with you to Blair? What was that? What was that process like? Yeah, I asked them that all the time, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I had been a college coach, but I'd never been a head coach. And uh, Lou Dang had come through a contact of mine at UConn. Um, he was actually going to go to St. Thomas More and play for the legendary Jerry Quinn, but he wanted to come with his sister, and they don't have girls at St. Thomas More, so I kind of got Lou all by default. Um, that way. And, and, and Royale, um, he was a low major player when he came to us for a post-grad year at Blair and uh, blossomed into a 10-year NBA vet. And uh, now he's the assistant coach with the, the Brooklyn Nets. And actually, I'm going to be his assistant. We're both coaching the South Sudanese men's national team at AfroBasket this summer. Um, so the wall is the president of South Sudan basketball. Roy's the head coach and I'm the head assistant. So it's crazy how 1999 comes full circle in the summer of 2021 in Rwanda. Who would have guessed? Wow, that's that's amazing. <laughs> um, now that you've been there this long, uh, when kids are looking at Blair, what's your pitch to them? Like, what, tell me a little bit about Blair School or Blair Academy, and you know the culture, the academics, the basketball. Why come there? What's your pitch? Yeah, I mean, listen, we're we're a we're a world-class academic school. So first of all, I, I, you know, as soon as a kid is not serious about the academic piece to this, he's out right out of the gates. Um, and secondly, you know, we want guys that love basketball, not like basketball. I think there's a lot of kids out there that like basketball. They like the process of development. They like the Instagram likes and they like the attention they get by all these, all this nonsense that surrounds the game, but there's really not many kids that love it. And then to love it, 
and on top of that want to do the schoolwork because there's a lot of easier roads than coming to Blair Academy. I mean, you can go to a prep school where the academics aren't nearly as rigorous as here, or kids can stay home and be a big fish in a small pond um, and, and maybe not develop as much as they would here and not play the you know world-class competition we play. But let's let's face it, it's, it's easy to stay home and be the big man on campus. It's easier to go a place where they don't demand the academics. So um, we've become kind of a self-selecting place. You know, I, I really don't feel like I'm pitching per se. I feel like we're choosing the kids who fit us best and we're really being truthful with them about what we are and what they're going to have to do here and that they're really choosing a tougher road. And if they do choose it, then then it really for the last decade plus, it's worked out great. Gotcha. So now, since you can be more selective with these kids, obviously, I was going to get into this later, but we can get into this now with COVID and with these kids that you picked to come to Blair, has it been hard for you to place them at the college level? No, I mean, the college basketball landscape has greatly changed, Corey. And I know you know this, obviously, it's, it's your line of work. But while the landscape has changed, I, I do think that other than the transfer portal, the college coaches are starting at the elite basketball programs at the prep school level. And so, you know, I had a guy go to Kansas, a guy go to Duke, and two guys go to really academic division threes, Trinity College and Colorado College. So, um, you know, we got four great placements. Um, we were really just choosing between really good options for these kids. Um, I think because I've shot so straight, been so truthful and straightforward with college coaches for over two decades, when they come to me, um, they know what they're getting on the other end. And, and so I think, you know, if there's parents out there that, that are looking at you as a, as a consultant and whatnot, I mean, I think as they look at schools, that's what you're looking for. You have to look for people like yourself in the, in the, in the consulting business that have high level of credibility. And then also a prep school coach that continues that level of credibility. So you guys can work together. So it sounds like you're going to still, the COVID is not affecting who you're going to take next year. You're taking kids anyway, they're going to be placed and you've got that track record with these guys that it should be business as usual, as far as you're concerned. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I think the pool is larger. Um, there's been even more kids wanting to come. So no COVID, you know, really messed up our winter and we only played two games and we we're blessed enough to have a five week bubble and train all year. But, um, no, I don't, I don't, if anything, I think COVID has just given us more access to more really outstanding kids to choose from. Yeah. Now you play in the Maple League. Tell us what makes the Maple League special. So I think a lot of people that know the academic prep school level think about New England. And, and there's obviously the NEPSAC in New England is a, is a great conference and there's a lot of levels of the NEPSAC. So, so we are the Maple Mid-Atlantic Prep League and that's school, six schools from New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, and, and I would say we're basically like the NEPSAC uh, AAA or let's see, what's the highest? AAA the highest? Mm -hmm. we, we're like NEPSAC AA, you know? So, so last year we beat um, a couple of triple A teams. And, and when we're really good, we can play with everybody. Um, you know, I think we were ninth in the country in prep schools and all prep schools last year. But what makes the Maple great is that we can access competition in New Jersey and Pennsylvania against parochial schools um, that play at a high level. And then we can play each other. And then we travel into New England and play and internationally into Canada and play all the best prep schools we can. So it gives us you know, I think the NEPSAC schedule is a prep school only schedule and they're locked into 24 games every year. We're only locked into eight or nine games. So we play showcases all over the East Coast. We go into New England. So what I tell kids all the time is, first of all, New Jersey is the mecca of basketball right now. You look at who's come out of this state and who, you know, Kyrie Irvin and Towns and the guys we've been able to play and compete against. Um, and then also still be able to access high level prep school basketball down here in the middle States and also in new England. It's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're going to do a quick fun segment. We started a couple episodes ago called fun, famous alumni from <laughs> no your doubt. prep school. And, you know, I tweeted this out a few days ago. I don't I just randomly picked you guys, but, uh, I'll make <laughs> <What's that? laughs> I did see that. I believe it's fun. I mean, cause you know, it's, uh, it's just fun stuff that maybe people don't realize the um, the magnitude of alumni have come through. And, and mind you, there's some big time people that aren't you know commonly known, but just just a little bit more the, under the radar. But first one is Jack Bogle. Yeah, so Mr. Bogle, um, before his passing, became a friend, and uh, 
you know, he he founded. He's a he's an alum who founded Vanguard uh, Investments and Vanguard Bank, and and basically he invented um, he invented index index mutual funds, and and so all of his grandkids came here. Um, he was a guy that supported my program, and uh, he was just a visionary in the investing world. And for me to have dinner with him a couple of times and, and just talk to him was was incredible and 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 he was just a a, a beautiful man and, and a great family man and, and a real um you know real generous guy with our schools so uh yeah it, it's funny when you meet people that are you know on the forbes 100 list of wealthiest guys in the country at one point and et cetera, et cetera. you know he's just the most humble down to earth great great at asking questions you know one to know about your life and i i i've taken a lot from that you know, learning from those people like, wow, you know, he's not he's not above the rest of us, even though he was. That's not a, I guess that wasn't a short answer, Corey. Sorry. No, we got all the time in the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I've been with Vanguard since 2002, just because I read over and over again about index funds and Warren Buffett. Uh, I think he when he when he passes, he's going to be like, yeah, just put all my stuff in an index fund and uh, don't touch it. Yep. So revolutionary. Do they actually teach about indexing and financial literacy at Blair? Well, Mr. Bogle used to come here and talk all the time before his passing. So yes, we do, and and he actually used to um, at a, at a different time. So it was it was really cool to hear him talk about. It. I believe it started out as his thesis at Princeton. No kidding. Okay. Imagine that, huh? Imagine founding something like that and turning it into what it's become. It's just it's pretty pretty extraordinary. All right. Next up, Tucker Max, best-selling author. Yeah. Um, not sure Blair's super pumped that he's an alum. Uh, I know. A guy, uh, but uh, yeah, he was from a different era of Blair Academy in the kind of 60s and 70s when we weren't the kind of school we are now. So uh, yeah, he's a, he's an interesting guy. He does not get invited back here to yep. speak. Yep, yep. Just letting, you know, I'm just, there's plenty of, I'm just trying to pick out the fun little ones that are out there. Uh, Ed Sable, founder of NFL Films. Yeah, how about that, right? Talk about another visionary. I mean, mm -hmm. the guy basically changed sports media from what I understand and sort of all of his on-field and miking people up and all, all the uh, this almost voyeur way that he shot football, NFL football, and, and the sounds behind it was, was really changed the way sports was covered. So um, I know your wife's a filmmaker, so I, I think you would probably have more to say about it than I would, but I think he really, really changed sports journalism. Yeah. And anyone I'm missing any other couple quick hitters there that are pretty obvious aside from the NBA guys. Yeah. No, all my guys. Right. Um, uh, no, you know, I mean, we've had Olympic champion wrestlers here, which is, which is pretty cool um, who come back and um, I'm sure I'm forgetting tons. Oh, you know what? Our, our, the head of the board of trustees right now is a guy named Doug Kimmelman who used to own the Yankees. Mm -hmm. He owns the Marlins with Derek Jeter now, and he's one of the foremost um, uh, people in terms of energy. Uh, Trump actually asked him to be his energy advisor um, when, when he became president. Mr. Kimmelman didn't do that, but um, you know he's a he's a guy that has kind of changed the way energy is looked at uh, across the world. So he he's a he's a guy you may want to Google. And does does Blair have solar panels? We do. We do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. That was, uh, that was this week's segment of fun alumni from the prep school we're talking to. So I think we're going to keep it going. It's, it's, I enjoy it. Um, so you've coached multiple NBA players to include Lou Alding, Charlie Villanueva, um, Royal Ivy and Mariel Shayok. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but tell me this, what did they possess that got them to that next level that maybe other players did not? Yeah, and I, and, I, and I coached a guy named Mike Toby who's playing over in Spain now in the top league, but he played for the Hornets for a couple of 10 days. So we brag about five instead of four. Okay. You know, we got we to throw Toby in there. Um, I, I, I get asked this question a lot. You know, I, I think that um, those guys all had a will and a resilience that is uncommon. Um, they all had the requisite talent, but a lot of it was just the ability to keep coming back, getting through failure, um, self-belief in the face of adversity. Now, you know, once you have the requisite skill set and athleticism, so much of it then, you know, comes down to the mental piece. And, and all five of those guys mentally could grind, could get through adversity, wouldn't lose their confidence if they shot 0 for 5 and a quarter. And, and, I, and, I, and, and then their level of competitiveness was 
you know, unique. Um, and, and so can I teach that to your third grade kid? No, you know, we, we, we teach that we teach, uh, incremental progress in those areas every day. But, you know, some guys are just gifted with an incredible will, um, and an incredible resilience and, and all five of those guys had it. So you born with that then? I think it can be increased, but I think guys are born with a pretty high level of it. Um, and if they're not, I think they're, they're born with such a high level of talent. I mean, I've coached some guys that weren't that, that had a lot of success, but they were just so absurdly talented that they could overcome some of the mental stuff. You know, uh, Royale was not like that. Lua was not like that. Um, you know, they, they had to really, uh, Meryl Shayok's an unbelievable story. I mean, that those guys had to really, really dig down to work. Yeah. You know, cause people always look in that third grade parent you're talking to is looking for the prescription to get that will buried in their kid at a young age. Then I'll take them off to, to stardom. And it's just, I think a lot of it is just, I think it's inside you, you know, I, I, I do. do. I, I, I do. I mean, my kids get sick of it. I always say that I, I always use the word yet to my kids, which I think is a Carol Dweck thing, you know, like, I can't do that math problem when they were in third grade. Well, you can't do it yet, but, but you haven't, how many reps have you had of it? So I, you know, I, I, I do think we can instill a growth mindset in people. Um, you know, the resilience, you know, I think we can try to instill that stuff. And, and then the other thing that I grapple with all the time is like, what's the price of greatness, right? Like how much do we all have to sacrifice to be a great coach? Certainly to be an NBA basketball player. Like what are you willing to sacrifice? How healthy is it? The level of sacrifice that we all need to, to try to be great at something and, and what aren't we getting? And, and then also like, what makes you resilient? You know, like, have you had trauma in your life that makes you willing to, you know, and, and, I mean, I look at a guy like Lou Dang, and he never, never, never talks about it. But like if you were escaped Sudan in the middle of the night to, you know, to live in a refugee camp in Egypt and, and you've been poor your whole life, do you have a different level of grit than, than somebody who's been more comfortable? Like, I don't know. I, I think if you say that, it takes away from somebody's work. He still had to do all the work. But is that a piece of it? You, you know, so I. I grapple with these things all the time, whether parenting my own three kids or the next batch of 14 year olds coming to Blair. But I, I think it's a, it's a fun conversation to have. You know, what makes it interesting too, is then you get Steph Curry who grew up with everything he needed and look at the level he's playing at. So it's, it's, it's okay. that both extremes and then everything in between, right? Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about Sudan a little bit. You and I share a, a small, um, uh, thing in common that we've both been there and not many people go to Sudan. It's not a tourist. It's probably near the, in the bottom five of tourist locales in the world to go visit, but you do a lot of work there. Tell us a little bit about the first time you went to Sudan and why, you know, what, what your thoughts are on, on the, on the culture, on the basketball and on the future. So I work with South Sudanese immigrants all over the world, Australia, North America, um, uh, overseas, but I've not been to South Sudan. So it's, it's on the bucket list, but you've been in Khartoum and just regular Sudan at least. No, I have not. So I, I have not, okay. fact, I haven't been to Africa this summer. When I go to Rwanda for Afro basket will be my first time to Africa. My wife does missionary work in Kenya. She's been a couple of times, but so it's on my bucket list to go with Luol. Um, I have a young man from South Sudan on my team right now. Who's a rising senior. Um, I will be in South Sudan at some point, but no, uh, unlike you, I have not been there yet. Yeah. And just, just to let people know, when I went to Sudan, I was going from top to bottom of Africa for about four months, riding a bicycle. That's a whole nother story in itself. But Sudan was interesting because we were all nervous to go there because all you heard on the news back in 2006 was genocide and civil war. And when we crossed that border from Egypt and Wadi Hafa at the north, north part of the, the country, um, we rode dirt roads. It was, it was really sandy and tough riding, ended up in Khartoum and then ended up uh, a couple weeks later getting down to Ethiopia. But all we knew about, or most of us knew about the Islamic faith was Al Qaeda, unfortunately, right? Cause Osama bin Laden spent time there. And we all, after that trip, one all bonded because of how tough the bike riding was, but two people in villages would come out and screaming at you to come into their hut and, and share tea with them. And they didn't speak English. It's just they wanted to just, uh, you know, show hospitality to, to outsiders. And 
we all said yes, which is the hardest country to bike ride through, but also the friendliest country of all the 15 we went through in Africa. And so now, um, anytime anyone asks me about or, or says something disparaging about Islam or Muslim, I'm like, no, 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 no. All you're hearing about is the small fraction that gives it a bad name. This is a great religion. Sudan, which gets a bad rap sometimes, is a beautiful culture. And, and unless you saw that in the ground, you would never know that. So that's why every time um, I see Sudan in the news or um, I see a, another South Sudanese basketball player, I think of just that, that beautiful culture and how, unless I was riding a bike through there, I never would have known any, any different, Joe. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, everything we know about these faraway places are through these media tidbits, right? And, and that, you know, what the media focuses on, whatever side of the media you're on, you know, internationally, the, it's, it's getting tea in a hut on a, on a hot bike ride is not what gets you clicks and not what the media focuses on. And it's unfortunate, but uh, there, there's a lot of work to be done there. And, 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 and my brother, Luol Dang, is, is doing incredible work there right now on a humanitarian front, um, on a basketball front, and melding the two, and just really giving a whole generation of young kids, guys and gals, hope, you know, and, and a way out and a, and a window. Um, and so... I, you know, I admire so much what he's doing for his home country because he could easily sit in his beachfront house in Miami and just say, I escaped and send money. But he's on the ground. He was just there. He called me from South. He called me from Juba three or four days ago, you know, and was was talking so excitedly about the clothes and the food that he was dropping off and the work he was doing with the South Sudanese national team and and the and the these uh, single form houses that they that he's allowing to be built now that he's helping to be built and also these apartments for ngo workers so they can come in and and do and do work on the ground in south sudan so yes i, I couldn't agree with you more Corey. and it was luau if he wasn't the first he was one of the first sudanese players to play division one right huh um yeah i would i would say he would have been one of the first now there's been so many you know i mean i look at our roster right now that we're looking at to try to cut this team down for afro basket this summer and there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of guys was yinka Dari, was he sudanese no yinka Dari is not sudanese okay no. okay no. so so let's put my, my point is luau is one of the first and since then there are sudanese kids on rosters at every level of division one Absolutely. And do you attribute that to Luau actually breaking out, making it to Duke and the NBA? Do you think he was a catalyst for that? Yeah, I don't think there's any question. And his older brother, Ajo Dang, who played at UConn, was actually a great player until he got hurt. Um, but I, I do think that. And, and, you know, we're really working closely with all these South Sudanese second generation kids in North America as well. There's a lot of kids in central Canada. Um, and there's a lot of kids in the Midwest of the United States, as you know, um, they Omaha. came through, yeah, they came through the Lutheran church to work in meatpacking factories. And so they're, they're Omaha, Sioux Falls, Iowa city, um, and, and plenty of other places too. But, um, so there's these pockets of Sudanese immigrants in New Hampshire as well, Manchester, New Hampshire. So Maine, um, and so we're trying to work with that, that constituency because those kids, they, uh, the, it, culturally in South Sudan, uh, the parents don't talk a lot about what it was like at home because it was pretty terrible, frankly. It was the reason they were fleeing. And so they don't talk about it a lot. And so these kids are growing up as kind of um, American, you know, African American kids, for lack of a better phrase, but without a lot of uh, insight into what their parents had to overcome and what their parents' lives were like before they left. And I'm speaking in generalities, of course. There's There are exceptions to this, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool to, to, to have people from South Sudan come together with the, the second generation kids from the U.S. and Canada and talk to them about what life is like in South Sudan versus what life is like in Sioux Falls or Omaha. And it, it, I think it helps everybody. Oh, yeah. And then there's also like Sudan to Australia and then Australian kids here. Yeah, and you're I've involved had, in that a little bit too, right? I've had two of those guys here. Yeah, I've had the GAC. Two of the GAC brothers have played for me here. And yeah, there's a huge um, South Sudanese connection, as you know, in, in Australia. And there's a there's a great tournament called the National Classic that's played between all the South, the, all the Sudanese club teams in Australia. So mm -hmm. it's something to behold. The Wall and I flew into to Melbourne for that five years ago. And it was just, it was amazing. First of all, I was like being with Michael Jordan, as you might imagine. And <laughs> right. second of all, I've never seen so many seven footers in one gym in a weekend as, a, as I did in Melbourne. So yeah, there's, there's, 
we got some cool stuff going on and there's so much potential in that population and we're just trying to work really hard to to give these kids vehicles to get to great places in the u.s and to make sure they don't end up where people are going to use them up and treat them poorly because that's happening a lot yeah yeah and that's a whole another discussion about some of these pop-up places versus brick and mortar schools like you guys and all the other legit ones. That's our second podcast together, Corey, right? That's our next podcast together. It does. I mean, it's just that we could get every brick and mortar coach on and just, well, yeah, it, that's for another time. I started writing an article on it. My article got so long. I was like, I can't publish this. This is just, this is nuts. In fact, there was one the other day. I'm going to, uh, Brandon Goble of Juco Advocate. He, he's calling these places out. And there was one the other day that it just started. I'm not going to mention the name, but it says, we, <laughs> You know, it said like established, you know, April of 2012. Anyway, we have experience placing, you know, D1 and D2 players. It's like, how do you have experience if you just started last week? You know, he's like, well, that's what we project. You know, just pure lies. And there's so many families out there that just get duped. And it's just a matter of, hey, you can go to these places. There, there might be some fine ones. But you have to ask these 10 questions and feel confident in your answers. Then go there. But even then, no, there's no guarantees. And even if you go to Blair Academy, there's no guarantee you're going to get the level you wanted in the past because COVID has 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 changed everything so much. No, and listen, I, I, I mean, I, I have a multiple high major guys here now. I mean, we're having the conversation around who should go high major right now out of high school, because you know it used to be that you'd have a couple years to get your feet on the ground, and then they'd be loyal, and by the time you were a junior, you'd be able to be a high major player and play yourself into the rotation. But now these coaches are under so much stress. They're worried about getting fired. They're not going to wait for you. They're going to be able to bring in a guy from the transfer portal right over the top of you. And, and listen, you know, as I, I say all the time, like the leading scorer at some mid-major school who's 21 years old right now is better than most of my high major 18, 19 year old guys graduating from Blair who are top hundred kids in the country. I mean, it's, it's men versus boys. So you know, I'm not sure who should go high major right now. Um, you know, you, you might be better off going mid-major, killing it for two years and transferring up. You know, everybody thinks about kids transferring down, but there's also kids that are doing great at the place they were at and get to transfer up. Um, so, and there's some low major schools that are selling that, like come here for a year or two, crush it, and, and, and we'll set you up to transfer up. I mean, the landscape has changed so much, Corey. I, I sound like I'm 100 years old, but it's crazy. And, and we all have to just be adaptable and go with it unless the rules change back. Yeah, and we were on a podcast uh, roundtable this past fall trying to discuss this. And I guarantee you this time next year, Joe, we're going to see college programs that have experience of transfers and they're either going to love it or they're going to want to get back to high school, prep school, and the way they did it before. I think yeah, it's interesting. Like I was on three zooms with sec head coaches a few weeks back and um, about recruiting. And, and, uh, one of my guys was transferring and I won't mention any names of coaches, but, but they sort of said in the sec, it's going to be like the G league. You know, I mean, it's basically, we're going to put together one year rosters and we're not going to guarantee anybody anything. And if it works out, you can stay here or go pro. And if it doesn't work out, you want to transfer down, we're just going to bring in eight more guys the next year. And I don't think there are guys out there now that aren't saying anything about family or culture or loyalty. They're just saying, I'm going to put a one year roster together every year. Now, I don't think that's the case at these low division ones, but you know, at some of these SEC schools, it's, it's basically the G league now. And uh, you know, that's not what any of us, that's not what I got into college coaching in 1991 to do. You know, I wanted to be able to, to mentor young men and, and, and build, build a culture and a family, which is what I do here at Blair. But the world is changing. It's transactional. It's one year at a time. And it's really, really hard to navigate. Yeah, and, you know, my hometown of Kentucky, obviously, or Lexington, Kentucky, UK has been doing this for years now. And what's happening is even though every so often you're going to be in the final four of a chance to win a title, the fans don't get to follow these guys for four years. So they're starting to get disenfranchised. I think season ticket sales are going down. I've got friends that are, have played there that can't say it publicly because they'll disrupt the big blue nation, but they're not happy with the way it's going. So if you have a bunch of assassin mercenaries come in for one year and you win a title, is it the same as having guys you like Christian Leitner and Bobby Hurley who've been following? Now I'm talking a time machine that's 30 years ago, so it's not realistic, but those guys are part of the culture. They, they were in class. They were seen around town for four years and just 
how's this going to work out? So that's, that's one of my pitches for post-grad is since I think there's going to be so many shifts over this year of college coaching and how they're going to do things by this time as an insurance policy, do a post-grad year and see how everything pans out. Cause it's going to be different. I think next May than it is right now. Cause then we'll have seen how the transfers worked out for some of these programs that maybe haven't gone that route before. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Corey. Listen, I, I said this to a college coach the other day. I'm worried about college basketball going by way of boxing and even MLB. Like, I, I actually think there's a world where college basketball isn't even that big a deal in 20 years from now. I mean, I you know, it'll always be a big deal at, at Center College, right, in, in, in Kentucky. You know, it'll always be a big deal at the D2 school up in New England, you know. but And it'll probably be a big deal at Yale. Um, because they'll be doing their thing differently. But I do worry if it becomes this one-year transactional thing, and to your point, they can't follow these kids, um, and there's no loyalty either way, right? No loyalty coach to kid, no loyalty kid to coach. Um, I, I just worry. I don't find the product that easy to watch at the highest level right now. All these great coaches, great coaches, have to dumb down their system because they don't have time to teach, and these kids play right away, you know, and, and again, this is not old man. I, you and I both know we're similar age. The, 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 the Christian Leitner, Bobby Hurley, the Phil Ford, like that's not coming back. But the question is, will anyone care about it in 10 years? Now, you know, there'll still be scholarships for the kids you and I are working with. And, and what's more important than getting college for free, of course. But my point is, in terms of the public, um, you know, really falling in love with what college basketball is. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I find the product not very watchable, and I don't know who the kids are, and these amazing coaches, guys who forgot more about basketball than I know, they don't have time to put their systems in and teach guys over the course of many years. And so, you know, it's just not that great. And so let me ask you this. I'm going to make you king of the NCAA. What changes do you make to prevent that from happening? I, I don't think you can. I, I think you have to give player movement. I think it's the right thing to do. I'm totally in favor of player movement. Um, I think the transfer portal, from a, it's, it's, it's not going to be great in terms of, of the public, but I think it's the right thing for the student athletes. So I don't know that I would change it. Um, I think what's going to happen is between these overtime leagues and the Ignite, I think it's going to be, I think we're going to be in a more of a European model 10 years from now. I spent a lot of time in Europe in the summers around the basketball world. And, you know, I think there's going to be academies, real academies that they don't even try to say have anything to do with academics are going to pop up for kids. And I think there's going to be more academy stuff. And I think kids are going to be making choices earlier, whether they're an academy kid or whether they're a prep school kid or they're, whether they're, you know, a public school guy and, um, I worry about that because what I see in Europe is a lot of these kids, they get hurt um, or they just don't end up being good enough. And now they've sort of foregone their their college education. So that's, the, of course, the downside to going a more of a, a academy route. So anyway, I'm probably getting down a crazy rabbit hole right now. But those are a few of my thoughts. No, and that's a good thing. But, you know, so I've had four former players that have gone in the transfer market and all of them have upgraded at big time levels. Right. They started out low. They've, they've produced and now they're going to great places it's going to have a great great uh to have on your basketball resume as well as your academic degree right and then i've got a couple of kids that have been in the portal and they're still they're still trying to find something they're scrambling so i think it's a free market economy to where kids should be able to do it almost but we're going to know this after a few years how it's it's going to pan out and it's kind of depressing you putting that that boxing and mlb analysis on it but you might be right on this. You might be right. But then you're going to have the purists. Like there's still boxing purists out there. They still fill arenas. You still got the major league purists. So maybe it's just not going to be, maybe March Madness was when people tune in and that's it as far as like the general public. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, who would you rather watch? Would you rather watch a bunch of one and done guys at Kentucky or Duke or, or you know, you fill in the blank UCLA or would you rather watch Steph Curry and LeBron tonight? You know, I mean, I know which way I would vote. Now, you know, you're out in Kentucky, so... You know, I'm an East Coast guy. This is pro sports out here, right? Like, I, I you know, I, I understand that certain parts of the country are, you know, like you said, the big blue nation and all that. I, if you're starting to say that there might be, the tide might be turning at Kentucky, then geez, I would worry about college basketball if that's the case. 
Yeah. And it's turning, you know, my wife's from Nebraska, Nebraska football, the tide's changing there too, because they're not winning. And that's, I, I think those are the two most hardcore programs in each sport in America. So now Nebraska's due to not winning, but um, <laughs> it can happen. You're not guaranteed to have that fan base. Yeah. If it's up to me, I'd rather go to uh, a, a New England or, you know, a prep school showcase event and watch those guys personally over the other two options you mentioned. Uh, me too. I Listen, I have made my life doing that. And uh, I, I think young, talented guys playing their hearts out um, for each other and for their school is uh, is pretty cool. And it's frankly what I always loved about college basketball. I mean, I think right now we're the closest thing to the old school, high level college basketball. When I say we, I mean high level prep school basketball. Yeah. What did you do outside the box during COVID that maybe you didn't do before in your coaching or, or training? Well, we formalized a lot of the informal conversations that we always had. So, so we did a lot of work with this summer of discontent. We did a lot of work on, on the Black Lives Matter movement. We did a lot of work on trying to f find out where our blind spots were as a team, where our blind spots were as a school, and engaging the guys on our team to talk about a lot of social issues. So that's one thing that I've always done, but we did it in a more formalized manner. Um, the other thing we did outside of the box is we did a lot of Zoom film work. So we would cut up edits, my assistant and myself both, we cut up edits for guys and we'd jump on Zooms and go through their edits. Or we'd find YouTube film of Dame Lillard or YouTube film of Draymond Green or you fill in the blank, you know, Paul Pierce using screens and footwork and, and we'd go over film with guys that way. And then the last thing we did, which I, I don't need, want to turn this into a coaching podcast, but we slowed down with our skill development, Corey, because we weren't allowed to play live when we first came back in the fall. And so all we could do was sort of one on oh skill development, which we've always done, but we did more of it. And we slowed down instead of trying to put stuff in, we just taught skill, 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 skill. And when we finally got to play in our five week bubble, golly, we made shots and our passes mm. were crisper. And, you know, I've spoken at a few virtual coaching clinics the last month and I've I've shared that with people like I think I'm actually going to continue to slow down and, and not try to teach so much. So, um, you know, there's a lot of silver lines that come out of it. And, and, and I, I would say, you know, it was a bit of a midlife crisis for me. I mean, it was a you know midlife crisis, I guess, a bad thing, sabbatical year. You know, I, my coaching staff and myself, we turned it into a sabbatical year. You know, I, we really tried to hone our craft. I lost 20 pounds. You know, I began to write in a, in a gratitude journal. Um, did a little yoga. Um, I've just tried to kind of restructure my life, pivot a little bit and come out the other end, a better coach, a better husband, a more healthy adult. Um, so we, we try to make it a, a positive sabbatical year. That's great. How do you feel after losing 20 pounds and doing yoga and all this stuff? <laughs> Listen, I want to be as feeling as good as you look, man, but I, uh, I, you know, I feel, feel better sleeping more and eating less and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be a better coach because of it. I think I'm, I'm I, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm a more functional adult right now than I was a year ago. Yeah, that's good stuff. I like, that's good. Slowing down the fundamentals and, and working on a sabbatical. I love that. Uh, a couple more things here. What was the, who's shown up for you as a player and been the biggest surprise? Because as people maybe don't know out there that listen to this, you might recruit a kid based on just film without ever seeing him in person. And then he shows up on campus and he's either worse than you projected or he's a surprise and better. Who's been one of the biggest surprises for you? Well, I had a kid, Tucker Richardson, that we took four years ago. He's been on two of Colgate's NCAA tournament teams. Um, and, and Matt Lang at Colgate calls him the best basketball player he's ever coached at any level. And he was just a kid we kind of took on a whim. We thought he'd be a good, solid, you know, maybe Division two kid or maybe low Division one kid. And he just turned into, he didn't turn in, he already was. We, we had underestimated him. He's a winner, knows how to play, super skilled. And, and what I think people miss is he's an incredibly uniting personality. He, could, he united a locker room. Every team the kid plays on wins big. His high school team, his prep school team, and he's been to two NCAA tournaments at Colgate. He was rookie of the year in the Patriot League. And like, I think when you evaluate people that you want to bring into your family, your basketball family, you have to bring guys that bring joy into your locker room and you have to bring guys that can unite a locker room. And, you know, I got kids from Africa, Australia, 
inner city African-American kids, wealthy, full pay African-American kids, white kids from all over the country. And we love it that way. We want to be a melting pot program. I just think guys grow so much from being around people that are different than them. But when you do that, and we've done it for 20 plus years, you know, you have to have personalities in the locker room that can, can you know, build bridges between different cultures and different ages and different maturity levels. And Tucker was just one that comes to mind. I'm looking at him on my office wall now um, as a guy that could do that. Gotcha. That's great. What about the biggest win of your career? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, honestly, what I tell young coaches all the times is the wins – the wins sort of fall by the wayside and the relationships is what you remember. But, you know, we won a big state championship game at Blair Academy two years ago, two years ago. I'm losing track of the years because of COVID three years ago. Um, that was the first time we had won a state championship in our own gym, packed gym, came back, scored 80 something points in the game, cut down the nets um, with a, with a group of super talented together dudes. So I, I would say that state championship in 2000, uh, 18 would probably be the most meaningful night. But, um, you know, there's some of those wins early on, man, when you're uh, coming up as a coach and you don't know if you know what you're doing, you don't know how good your team is. I think any head coach would tell you those early teams you have and those big wins you have with your first teams. Um, I imagine Coach K looks back at Billis and, and, and those guys, Johnny Dawkins and those guys, and, you know, no one – you're never going to feel about any group of guys any more than you feel about that first winning group you had. So we had some great squads with Royal Ivy and Lou Aldang and Ben Kenyon, who's the strength coach for the Philadelphia 76ers now, and Charlie Villanueva. You know, that group of guys won some huge games. We just barnstormed around the country and beat everybody's face in. So that was pretty fun, too. Yeah, and just to let you know about Coach K, I've heard this in an interview once. His favorite or biggest win ever was the seventh place tournament win at some – some game at Army, they were in some tournament, and they were in seventh place game against the eighth place team, and they won that one barely. And he's like, yeah, that's the best win of my career because that seventh place win meant we weren't eighth place. And I've always just remembered that. <laughs> yeah, people don't realize the level of how scared you are when you take your first head job because you don't know. You've never done it before. And, you know, I've been a college assistant for eight years, but moving down one seat, as they say, on the bench, you know, is a, is a big move. And, uh you know, those early wins are huge. So I couldn't agree with them more. What's the, who's the best player you ever coached against? Kyrie Irvin, mm. I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, Kyrie had verbally committed to coming to Blair. Um, and so, you know, I had six weeks where Kyrie was coming to Blair and then he reneged and, and uh, went to St. Pat's and then beat our face in the next year. And, and, and honestly, I know his dad pretty well, had known his dad before that. So Dred, Dredrick had told me that, you know, my son's going to be an NBA player. And, you know, I had never seen Kyrie. This is pre-YouTube. And uh, people had told me he was great. But um, he, he was the best high school player. The best high school player I ever saw in person, though, was Allen Iverson. Mm -hmm. When I was a college coach, I saw, I saw AI um, at an event down in Virginia. And, and college coaches are standing and cheering. And I had never seen that before. I mean, AI was just incredible in high school. Okay, where'd you coach in college? I coached at Lehigh University, Boston University, and two Division IIs, East Stroudsburg and Adelphi. So I coached all over the East. Okay, perfect. Um, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? I'm a, I'm a single handicap golfer, and I am a really below average gardener, but I love being out planting my perennials and uh, weeding uh, and listening to podcasts while I'm out weeding my garden. So that, that's what I like to do, along with obviously hanging out with my uh, wife and kids at the beach or whatever. Okay. What's your uh, favorite movie of all time? Uh, probably Goodfellas, maybe a little Hoosiers, but... Uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll give you a sleeper. Um, oh, my God, I'm drawing a blank on the, on the name now. Uh, Bronx Tale. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, that, that's kind of a sleeper. Kind of love that movie, too. All right, last question here. Have you ever met the real, or not the real, but the actor Joe Mantegna? So crazy you would ask me that question. <laughs> he emailed me last week. Are you kidding me? So he emails me out of the blue, dead out of the blue. I guess it was right after my kid Jalen Blakes had had committed to Duke, and so I'm sure my name was in the his Google search more than more than usual. Uh, and so he emailed me out of the blue and said, "Hey, sounds like you're doing great things. 
I just wanted to introduce myself. We share the same name. You might know who I am. Of course, I knew who he was. <laughs> and he said, you know, if you need any swag for any any fundraisers you're doing, like, don't hesitate. Like, I'll send you anything you need. Sign pictures out of the blue. I never had reached. Okay, Joe, I lost your audio there for that last part uh, after he said he donated swag. But um, that was our last question. That's a great answer regardless. So we'll just, if, uh, if your audio is out, we got a, me a majority of the um, uh podcast done but thanks so much for coming on joe we got joe academy here blair academy one of the greats out there and uh, if you like this podcast go ahead and subscribe on all the major pla podcasting platforms and, and on google or uh, youtube you'll never miss them and uh, thanks so much for tuning in we appreciate it